as I struggle alone They say I have nothing But they are so wrong In my heart I'm rejoicing How I wish they Greetings to all viewers. We are here to say welcome to you on behalf of the Wazul Natal Free State Conference. Once again, I am here to welcome you to our program. We believe that we are blessed every Sabbath as you view this program in the comfort of your homes. I'm here to say thank you very much. Without you, 
this program means nothing. Thank you very much for adding value. Thank you very much for viewing. And uh, it is our intention through the help of God and by the grace of God to deliver the message of hope to you, the message of deliverance, the message of uh, assurance that in spite of everything that you may be going through, we're never alone. We are not left alone to face. Our God is still able to deliver us and even to save us uh, through his power because his power is infinite. I just want to refer you to John 3 verse 16, which, which simply says that for God so loved the world that he gave one and his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. From that text alone, we have the heart of the whole scripture. Without John 3 verse 16, the Bible is incomplete. And so because of John 3 16, we have hope of salvation. We have hope of redemption. We have hope that whosoever, and I like to look at the phrase that says whosoever believes in Jesus will be saved. In other words, you and myself and everybody, everybody else in the world, for us to be saved must believe in Jesus. There's no other shortcut. There's no other way. The, 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 the way to salvation is only through Jesus Christ, whose name is beyond all other names, whose name is beyond compare, whose name is greater than all other names that are, are there out there in the world. So I just want to say welcome and just want to say sit back, relax, enjoy the program for today. And I'm, I promise you we are going to enjoy it because we as the Kazuna Television Conference has invited one of our local pastors here and that is none other than Pastor Stutuzo Blose, who is uh, around here in Deben, who is going to come to you to, uh, through to, uh, after, after, after this uh, short uh, well, word of welcome, and is going to tell us more about this God who cares for us, about this God who is our source of hope, our source of comfort, who, who, uh, who has an authority, even though he's in heaven. He has an authority over the whole world. He can heal our situation. He can heal our financial situation. He can heal our depression. He can heal our anxieties. He can heal everything that you may be going through. And so I just want to say to you, I introduce to you Pastor Blose, and sit back and relax. May the good Lord bless you all. I say thank you to all for viewing. Keep on viewing. There's some more to come even the following Sabbath part for today. Just enjoy this program as it comes to you. Pastor Plosse is our guest speaker for today. Pastor Plosse, welcome. You may now take the podium. Thank you. Greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no doubt in my mind that at this time, each and every single one of us uh, seated here listening to this message are going through some kind and some sort of struggle. If we are not, we are worried about one which is impending or one we are anticipating uh, to fall into. If that is not the case, then some of us are actually coming out of a struggle and out of a trial or a tribulation. Indeed, this has been a time of unprecedented problems, worries, trials, tribulations. None of us uh, could have ever anticipated 2020 to turn out quite the way that it has done. What is even worse is that what lies ahead is projected to be much worse than what we leave behind. And so at such times, it is quite easy and it's quite possible for us to fall into slip into some sense of depression, anxiety, and worry as we not only realize our fallibility or vulnerability to what is going on about us, but also our helplessness uh, to what is going on about us. In such times, what do we do? Who do we turn to? And of course, as this being a sermon and being a message, you already know the answer that I I'm going to suggest we all turn to and look to Christ as our sole hope and sole source of salvation and providence out of whatever it is that we might be struggling with and whatever it is that we might be going through. What is even funny, right, and this is by way of introduction, is that though the pandemic is global, the manner in which it touches and affects every single one of us has been particular, specific, and different to the next person. Some people have lost loved ones, some people have lost neighbors, others have lost 
their jobs. Others have lost their businesses. Others have lost children during this pandemic. Some of us have put on weight, which we are struggling now to shake off. Each and every single one of us have had a specific and particular encounter with what is a universal and global pandemic. What am I saying to you? That though we may be going through the same trials, the same struggles, the same tribulations, the manner and the nature of impact is specific to each and every single one of us, right? And so at this time, we don't need a God who is going to give us a global universal solution, but we also need a God who's going to be specific and particular in how he intervenes, in how he addresses and deals with how this pandemic and with how this lockdown and with how these economic meltdowns have impacted and affected each and every single one of us. We don't need him to give us a blanket solution. We need God to give us a specific solution. And this is the kind of God here today that I'm going to present to you. And it is particularly why I say during this time and during this period, Jesus remains our only hope and our only way out. I want to take and draw your attention before I pray to the book of John chapter 5. And the Bible says in John chapter 5, and I read from verse 1, it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called Bethesda, uh, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of people who were sick, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the waters. For you see, there was a belief that an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And I'm sure we can attest and testify to this, that while we've prayed for things for a long time, while we have fasted and while we have waited for our breakthroughs there's always someone who seems to go ahead of us and jumps into the queue and receives their breakthrough even before us at times even grabbing the very blessings that were intended and meant for us and of course this text addresses this as you will hear later on then Jesus says to him rise up take up your bed and walk and immediately the Bible says the man was made well took up his bed and walked and that day was the Sabbath the Lord always adds a blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Now, dear Father, we are about to traverse and enter into a tricky terrain. We are about to enter into your word, oh dear Father. Between us and your word is a distance of geography, is a distance of culture, it's a, dis a distance of time. We were not there when it was written. We were not there when these stories happened, oh dear Father. And of course, between us and your word is a distance of self-interest, self-seeking, and self-serving. Sometimes when we read your word, oh dear Father, we don't read it to be edified. We read it for others. At times when we read and we listen to your word, we don't listen to it for, for it to change us and transform us. We listen to it to inform us so that we can act smarter than everyone else and so dear father we ask at this time for your holy spirit to close these gaps these gaps of time these gaps of self-interest these gaps of spiritual deafness oh dear father let your spirit touch us at this time oh dear lord to ensure that your word resonates and finds a place and a residence in our hearts at this time we pray in a special way oh dear lord that as you give the preacher clarity and lucidity of speech you may also give us as hearers lucidity and clarity of mind and heart, oh dear Father, that we may be able to not just hear what you're saying, but to be transformed by what, by what we have heard. We pray all of these things, not because we are worthy, but we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And of course, if you still remember my introduction, right, that there is a global pandemic, there is a global uh, 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 virus that is ravaging and transforming and changing people's lives, altering them, not for the better, but for the worse. And of course, we have heard during this time that some have prospered during this time. Some have prospered as a result of others' misfortunes. So as I said earlier on, this pandemic and this, and this global virus hasn't all affected us all the same way. It has been 
in particular. It has been specific in how it impacts and in how it touches each and every single one of us. In this verse, we find a man who was lame, lying at the pool of Bethesda, a particular and specific condition. What? But this condition of his, as John records, occurs at a time of a universal of a universal feast. It happens during a time of festivity. So while everyone else was enjoying and celebrating the feast, everyone else was celebrating and preparing for the Passover. There was a man at the pool of Bethesda who couldn't move. There was a man at the pool of Bethesda who couldn't walk. There was a man at the pool of Bethesda who couldn't participate in the religious activities that were taking place at the time. So you see, there was a global, there was a universal event that was taking place, but it, 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 it affected and impacted this man in a specific and particular manner. But how to, but, but, but that is not, that's not all, right? It said, the Bible also says that in this pool of Bethesda, there were many sick who are lame and paralyzed. See how John records the specific conditions of everyone else who was at that pool of Bethesda. It seems that this pool was a place of gathering for those who are ailing, for those who are sick, for those who are suffering from various ailments. It seems as though this pool was a place of hopelessness. It was a place of hopelessness mixed with false hope, as I will get to right now. They had a hope that they would get better, but their hope was placed in something that was false. Now, 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 now John is very particular and specific in saying that though we all suffer, and just indeed though, though those who are all at the pool were suffering, they were not suffering the same way. Some were paralyzed, some were lame, some were blind. This man had an infirmity for 38 years. Do you see it? Do you hear it? Right. So there is a global Passover, global festivities, global time of, of, of prosperity. While others are going to worship, there are those who are incapacitated by their illnesses, by their by their sicknesses. There are those who are immobilized by their suffering. They can't even worship. They can't even participate in this Passover. And in that time when they could not go to the temple in order to worship God, the Bible says Jesus moved from wherever he was. He left this time of festivity. He left the celebrations. He left the Passover and he went to where the sick were. He went to where the immobilized were. When they couldn't get to him, he moved to where they were. What am I saying here today to you? There are two points that I've already touched on, which I'm sure and I'm hoping you would have picked up by now. That uh, while your suffering may not be the same as that of your neighbor, while your sickness may not be the same as that of your neighbor and your relatives, while your sickness may not even be the same as those whom you worship with, the Bible says Jesus is aware. God is aware. Not just God is not just aware, but he's, 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 he's acquainted with your suffering. He knows it intimately. Though he, he, does, he, he, does, he, just does, he doesn't just have a superficial understanding of what you are going through, but he has an intimate knowledge of what you are going through. And his intimate knowledge of what you are going through moves him from wherever he is to be where you are. So we don't suffer alone. We don't suffer in isolation. Yes, we have been on lockdown. Yes, we, some of us have to be isolated when we are suffering. But when it comes to God, God is not intimidated by your suffering. God is not intimidated by your, by your, by your, by your infected, by you being infected by the virus. He has no challenge. He has no problem acquainting himself, moving to where you are, and sitting in the ashes of your despair and suffering there with you. The Bible says, when we can't get to God, God comes to us. Indeed, my Bible. When I read the whole Bible story, I remember. Remember a time when we were separated from God by sin. The Bible says God emptied the whole of heaven and he sent his only son to come to us. In other words, when we can't get to God, when we couldn't get to God as a result of sin, God came to us so that we, in him being like us, we could be like him. Of course, I don't want to rush through this. I want to take you through it uh, nice and slowly. And so uh, I hope, friends, you're listening and I hope you're hearing this, that yes, indeed, the global pandemic, the pandemic is universal, it is global, but our suffering is specific. But so is God in, God's intervention, that God is not going to universally blanket, uh, give us a blanket solution of deliverance, that God is going to be specific in how he delivers us. We may all go through the same thing, but it doesn't impact us and affect us the same way. 
And therefore, God is specific. He's not a lazy God who wants to give us a solution for everyone, a one-size-fits-all. No, he is a specific God because we have not been impacted quite the same way. And of course, as I said to you, when we can't get to God, it is God who comes to us. I know people, and I know you are listening right now, and I'm grateful to God for this time of lockdown because suddenly we have discovered, and rather, let me say, we have been forced to use uh, social media, to use television media in order to preach the word of God. The word of God has been given new wings to get into homes of people who can't get to where the word of God is preached. Do you hear it? When you can't get out of home in order to get to where the word is preached, God has brought the word into our homes. Can you see it? That these miracles are not just limited to the Bible, but these miracles are happening in our times and in our lives right now. That right now you could be immobilized by finances, you could be immobilized by sickness, you could be immobilized by an inability to get to church because your churches are closed. The schools you worship in are school are closed. The places you worship in are closed. But God has made a way where there seems to be no way and ensure that his word gets to where you are right now. And so this text doesn't even need me to explain it because you are living it. You're experiencing it that the word of God, indeed God himself, is able to get to us when we are unable to get to him. Now what is so sad and what is so painful about this text, the Bible says that these men were at the pool of Bethesda, which was by the sheep gate, right next to the temple. How painful is that, that you can be so close to the house of worship, but unable to get in to worship, unable to gain access to the place of worship. And at this time, and I want to just maybe go into this for a moment, that some of us have limited worship to avenues and to centers of worship. We have limited worship to places. We have limited worship to locations. Here in the story, Jesus shows us that he is not a God who needs us to undertake pilgrimages in order to worship him. He's not a God who needs us to undertake long treks in order to get to where he is. He is a God who, when we can't get to him, comes to where we are and we and, and, and he's able to commune and worship with us wherever we are. Yes, indeed, in the book of Daniel, he is in the fire with the four Hebrew, with the three Hebrew boys, worshiping with them in the fire. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 25, he is with Paul and Silas in the prison, worshiping with Paul and Silas. Also in the book of Acts, he is with Peter in the prison, worshiping with prison, with Peter in the prison. In other words, this God that we worship, this God that we follow, this God that we have given our lives to is not a God who was limited and locked up in specific locations, but sometimes he even, he even transcends, he even disregards the nature and the laws of tradition, and he gets out of those places to be where we are. And I'm sure indeed we have felt the presence of God, we have seen him in our lives when we were isolated from churches, when we couldn't get to, be, to sit in front of pulpits and to, be, and to fill the pews. God ensured that he was where we were. This is a powerful God that we serve, a mighty God that we serve, the God who doesn't need us to go to him in order for us to commune with him, but he can ably at any time be where we are. Indeed, he is where we are. Let me go on. Uh, the Bible then says that Jesus walked in to the pool of Bethesda. There were so many sick people that were there, but Jesus saw the smear, right? The Bible says Jesus saw him and knew that he had been in that condition for a long time. I'm going to share this with you, and I've said it so many times before. The Bible says Jesus knew that this man had been in that condition for a long time. I'm going to share this with you historically and mathematically, right? There's a bit of mathematics here in the Word of God. The Bible says this man was 38 years sick for 38 years. He wasn't 38 years old. 38 years is the length of his suffering. He wasn't 38 years old. He had been sick for 38 years. Some of us have only been suffering for seven months and we were ready to give up. This man was sick for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, believing every single day that his breakthrough was going to come that year for 38 years, never giving up. So the Bible says, right, that this man was sick for 38 years. He wasn't 38 years old. He was sick for 38 years. Jesus was here on this earth for 33 years, lived up until he was 33 years old. So between the time that Jesus was here on this earth and, between, and the time 
that this man was sick. There's a five-year gap, right? But of course, mathematically, this is not the last Passover that Jesus celebrated, right? This is not the last Passover that Jesus celebrated when he was here on earth. So at this time, we can assume and estimate that Jesus must have been around about 32, 31 years old when he met this man at the pool of Bethesda, when he walked at the pool of Bethesda. So there is about a five, between a five and seven-year gap between the time that Jesus was here on earth and the time that this man was sick. So in other words, when this man fell ill and started being ravaged by this infirmity, Jesus was in heaven. When this man spent five years at the pool of Bethesda hoping for healing, Jesus was still in heaven. When this man was still at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus was being born. Jesus and Mary were still running away from Herod. When this man was still at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus grows up and he goes to be dedicated at the temple at the age of 12 years. This man is still at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus grows up and he starts collecting his disciples. This man is still at the pool of Bethesda. When Jesus goes to a wedding in Cana, this man is still at the pool of Bethesda. In other words, what happened to this man is not happening outside of Jesus knowing about it. God is aware. God is acquainted, not just with how much he has suffered, but also with the length of his suffering. Jesus knew about this man while he was still in heaven before he got to earth. Jesus knew about this man. But what has always grabbed me, what has always irritated me about the story, and what I find comfort in at the same time is the fact that why is it that when Jesus landed here on this earth, why didn't he just go straight to the pool of Bethesda and deliver this man? Why must it take so long to get to this man? If he knows about his condition and if he knew about his ailment, why didn't he just get here and go straight to where he was? Why didn't he just go and heal him? But let me share this with you, saints, and I'm hoping it'll be a word of encouragement. Trust a God who does not panic when you get into trouble. Trust a God who is not just in control of your situation, but is also in control of himself. The reason why Jesus takes long to get to this man, it is because his ailment, the man's ailment, the man's, the man's illness is not an emergency to Christ. For no matter how worse it can get, it is still not beyond his ability to reverse it. It is still not beyond his ability to redeem him from it. The reason why we panic when we fall into trouble, the reason why we panic when we fall into trials and tribulations is because we have a feeling that the longer they last, the stronger they will get. The longer they last, the more difficult it will be for us to be delivered from them. But not so for God. The length of your suffering does not deter his ability to deliver you from it. In fact, dare I say, that those who have suffered the longest have provided a terrain, have provided an avenue, a theater for God to show his greatest power. It seems as though God thrives in situations where it is, where everyone has thrown in the towel. It seems as though God thrives and believes in situations where everyone has lost hope of deliverance. It seems as though God thrives in situations where, situ where, where conditions have lasted longer than people thought was necessary. But look at this. Look at this as well. When Jesus intervenes, Though the illness was 38 years old, he does not take 38 years to deal with the illness. Though the illness took long, took 38 years, Christ and God's intervention is not as long as the length of the sickness. That's the power of God. That's how powerful this God we serve is. He's not only able to see us when we suffer. He's not only able to be specific with us in our suffering. He's not only able to know how long we have suffered before we even tell him. But God is also able to deliver us without expanding the same amount of energy that was used to oppress us and to suppress us and to cause us suffering. Now the Bible says this man was sick for 38 years. I want you to count this for me, right? He was sick for 38 years. And the Bible says when Jesus came to him, he says, get up and walk. How long did it take me to say those words? Get up and walk. How long did it take me to say those words? Definitely not 38 years. I don't have 38 years to talk to you here on this TV. It didn't, certainly didn't take me 38 years to say those words. You see it, you hear it. Your suffering, the length of your suffering, the length of your trials is not indicative of how long it will take God to deliver you from them. That though they may be long, God's intervention is momentary. God's intervention is timeless. It doesn't require God to take 38 years to deliver you from an ailment of 38 years. There was a woman who had a blood issue for 12 years. He didn't take 12 years to deliver her. In fact, he didn't even 
do anything to deliver her. She just touched the hem of his garment. The Bible says when, when, when this man was blind from birth, Jesus simply took mud, smeared it on his, spat on it, smeared it on his eyes and asked him to go wash his eyes. He was blind from birth. The, the, the solution didn't take as long as, as the suffering. The Bible says if you don't think this is a biblical phenomenon, you think this is just something that's limited to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there were mountains on their sides, an Egyptian army behind them, and there was the ocean in front of them. And God said, just lift up a stick, Moses, and the oceans and the waters parted. Do you see it? Do you see this pattern? Do you hear this pattern that somehow it seems that the more hopeless the situation is, the more simpler God's intervention is. That the more difficult the situation is, the simpler God intervenes, the simpler God's solution is. There was a, there's a fire that is lit up seven times hotter than normal. They're thrown in, they're expected to be consumed. People spend a lot of time trying to build up this fire and all God does. He doesn't create a storm. He doesn't create rain in order to stop the fire in the book of Daniel. But all he does is he shows up. And yes, indeed. Some of the solutions and some of our deliverance is not in what God delivers for us. It's not what God delivers to us so much, in so much more than in what God delivers f to us in himself. At times we expect God to deliver things to us when God wants to deliver himself to us. He doesn't bring rain. He doesn't bring the storm to put out fires. He doesn't bring, uh, he doesn't bring jobs to the unemployed. He brings himself in spite of our unemployment so that we can survive the conditions we are in through him without the solutions we think we need from him. But I digress. I digress. Let me say this to you. When this man was at the pool of Bethesda, his hope was not in God. His hope was in the pool. His hope was in the power of the pool. But as you realize, right, and as the Bible says, that there was this belief. It wasn't a real thing. They believed that an angel came down and stirred the waters and people jumped in and they were healed. Let me show, tell, share something with you about superstitions. Superstitions are powerful in that they are able to give us a temporary uh, idea of relief. They are able to give us a false sense of redemption and relief. I remember some time ago, I gained so much weight. I was, I was ballooning. My clothes were not fitting. And so I complained about this to a group of friends of mine. And my friend says, and then was, this one friend of mine says to me, don't worry, I've got a tea for you. There's a tea that if you drink, you will lose all the weight and you'll be slim again. And of course, in my desperation, I took this tea and I drank it for a few days. And he says, don't eat anything, just drink this tea. Oh, it was a horrible seven days, I must say, uh, of not eating and just drinking this tea. So he gave me this tea and I was drinking this tea for seven days. And I was, of course, I was going to the loo, just drink the tea and drink lots of water, drink tea and drink lots lots of water. And of course, at the end of the seven days, I'd lost weight. I'd shrunk around my waist. And I was happy that I'd shrunk around my waist. Of course, then I started eating again. Of course, I was managing my portions uh, correctly. I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was eating at the right time. I was eating the correct size of food. But do you know that in three or four days after that, all that weight came back. So what had happened was the superstition of the tea, all it had done was just it gotten rid of the water in my body. I was not slim. I was dehydrated. I wasn't, I was just, it was just water that was washed out of my, of my system. And therefore I looked, I looked less bloated than I was. But there's a belief. I believe that the tea had worked. It had made me slim. I believe that the tea had made me slim. So there are times when, when superstitions appear as though they work. There are times when superstitions appear as though they have an effect on us. They have a, they, they can deliver us. But if they don't, if they're not, if, if, if the deliverance is not temporary, then at times that deliverance is false and not long lived. And so as we find here that this man was at the pool of Bethesda, he was hoping that the angel would come and shake the waters. Do you see that even to the point of almost missing Jesus coming to save him, his hope was no longer in Jesus. It was no longer in God. His hope was now in the pool. Let me, let, let me, let me backtrack here for a moment. I don't want to leave some of you behind. I don't want to leave some of you behind. Number one, the first First thing that I want to say here is that God delivers us not because of the accuracy of our faith, but because of the diligence of his faithfulness to us. Let me say that again. God doesn't deliver us because of the accuracy of our faith, but because of
because of the stubbornness of his faithfulness to us. God, this man was not delivered because he had faith in God. He was delivered because God was faithful to his healing. This man was not delivered because he prayed eloquent prayers. This man was delivered because God dared to request of himself healing on this man's behalf. I hope you got that. This, you know, this man was not a beneficiary of his prayers. He was not a beneficiary of his faith. His faith was misplaced. It was placed and, and in the wrong things. But God still decided to heal him. We are not healed because of the accuracy of our faith. We are not healed because of our ability to understand scriptures. We are not healed because we don't sleep while praying. We are healed because God is committed to our healing. And so when Jesus walks in, he sees this man. And he knows that he's been in that condition and he, he heals him. He's not, this man, this man's faith is in the pool of Bethesda. Let me go to point number, that. this is the third point, B, right? So A is you're not healed because of the accuracy of your faith. But point three B is that you are healed because of God's diligence, right? Because of diligence, God's diligence and belief in your healing. And, 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 and so the point B is that God heals us in spite of, not, not because of. Hey. God doesn't heal us because of our faith, but God heals us in spite of our inaccurate faith, right? So this man has his faith in this tradition. He's got this faith in this traditional belief that an angel would come down and shake the waters, right? That's where this man's faith is. But he's healed, not because of that faith, but in spite of that inaccurate faith. We're not healed because of how we believe in God, some of the beliefs we have in God, some of the ideas we have of God, some of the pictures we have of God are so inaccurate, but God still continues to take care of us, not because of how we believe, but because of how he sees us. You see, the love of God is so stubborn that it is even able to look beyond our inability to understand him correctly, that some of us are not beneficiaries of our faith. We're not beneficiaries of our diligence when we pray, but we are beneficiaries of God's stubborn love for us. So we are not healed because of our faith. At times we are healed in spite of our faith. And of course, many of us are so caught up, captured uh, by traditions, captured uh, by, uh, what, by rituals. We think that we will only be healed if we, healed if we only perform certain rituals. This idea that we will only be healed if we do certain things for God, then God will respond in a particular way, means that we are worshiping go a God that we think we can manipulate. In the story, God tears those beliefs asunder. He breaks those, those beliefs asunder, and he goes through and he says, you you don't need a man of God to pray over you in order to get well. Do you hear it? Do you hear what I said? You don't need a man of God to hit you with a handkerchief in order for you to be well. You don't need to touch a man of God's shoes. You don't need to eat to drink petrol in order to get well. You don't need to kiss frogs in order to get well. You don't need to eat snakes in order to get well. The power of healing is not in the instruments. If the power of healing is not in objects. The power and the source of healing is God, and you've got direct access to God. You don't need to go to God through me. There's only one person that you need to go through in order to get to God, and that is Jesus himself. There is, he is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way for us to get to the Father. There is no other instrument, no other man that we need to consult in order to, to get to God, in order to, to gain access to God. Here in the story, we are shown that Jesus, tears traditional beliefs asunder. He tears uh, 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 superstitious beliefs and he, and, he, and, he, and he breaks them down and he goes to beyond and through them and he meets the man at his point of need. What am I saying to you? That if some of us are unable to hear God ask us this question. Do you want to be made well? We are unable to hear this question because our ears are full of traditional beliefs, are full of, 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 of ritualistic approaches to God. I'm not just talking about tradition outside of God, tradition inside of God. We've got this understanding that there are certain things we need to do a certain way in order for God to hear us. But here in the story, Jesus says, you're not going to come to me through various things. You're not going to come to me through things. I was talking to someone the other day. And they said they were praying uh, for someone and they and they and they and they put a Bible on their heads, right? They put this Bible on their heads and this person was made well. Now they believe they are, the power of healing is in their Bible. I said to them, look, man, it can happen. Maybe God used the Bible to heal the person. 
but the Bible is just an instrument. It's not a source of healing. The source of healing is God. Stop going to instruments for healing and go directly to God. Some of us, our suffering is not exasperated because of the nature and the depth intensity of the trial. It is, it is exasperated, exacerbated because we also load it with traditional, cumbersome, traditional beliefs that are, are so far removed from who God is. Like I said to you, we thank God that he doesn't save us because of our faith, but saves us in spite of our faith. Let me close with this thought. Then Jesus says to this man, take up your mat and walk. We've already been to this point. He was sick for 38 years, but it doesn't take God 38 years to heal him. You may have been unemployed for seven months, 12 years, five years. I don't know how long it has been, but it's not going to take God that long to deliver you. The solution will be immediate and swift. God doesn't take the same amount of time to deliver us as it took to persecute us. God doesn't spend the same amount of energy in delivering us as it takes to oppress and suppress us. If God needed the same amount of time to deliver us as it took to suppress and oppress us, then it means God and the oppressor are equal. So that is why God from time to time needs to show and to display some divine arrogance. Whereas the devil takes time to, to, to plan, to plot, and to suppress us, God takes seconds to deliver us. But here's the beauty of the story. Jesus then says to the man, get up and walk. If I had time, I would get into this question. Do you want to be made well? It's a curious question for Jesus to ask this man. Do you want to be made well? Why would you ask this man that question? It's precisely because some of us might be praying to get well, but really we don't want to get well, simply because we have become so married to our suffering. It, our suffering has become our identity. And so we don't know how to understand ourselves and our lives apart from our suffering. We really don't want to be made well. We pray for deliverance, but in reality, we don't want to be made well. We like to be unemployed because at least we remain someone's responsibility. We like to be in abusive relationships because then we gain the, we gain the community's sympathy, right? And so some of us don't want to be delivered. Some of us, not all, some of us don't want to be made well simply because we don't, we have become married. We have become addicted to our persecution. We have become addicted to our to our suffering the question is do you want to be made well are you sure this is what you want that what you're praying for is what you want some of us are asking for jobs but we have not even thought about the fact that we'll need to wake up at 4 30 a.m in the morning catch taxis in order to get to our jobs is are you sure that what you want is what you want are you willing to accept the suffering and the responsibility that it comes do you want to be made well that's a very powerful question that jesus is asking us today do you want what you are praying for do you want what you are asking from God? Are you ready for the responsibility? Are you ready for the transformation, the changes? Are you ready for the adjustments that are required by the blessing that you are praying for? Do you really want what you are praying for? Is this what you really want? You can think about that and have that conversation with your God. And then Jesus says to him, if you want it, then he says to you indeed today, if you want it, then get up and walk. This is not a request. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. And commands work, need to be obeyed. Commands need to be respected. Commands Commands need subservience. Commands need faith. So this man can't walk. He hasn't been able to walk for 38 years. And here's this command. And it says, get up and walk. There's something beautiful about commands, right? There's something beautiful about commandments. It is that when they are uttered, when they are given, they are also imbued. They are also, inside of them is inserted the power to keep them. So when this man, right, when this command is issued out, get up and walk, it comes with the ability to walk. This word of God, when it comes out, it comes with the power to enable this man to walk, right? But this man is required to first get up. He needs to believe in the reality, in the truthfulness of this command. He needs to believe in the, in, 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 in the, in the, in the, in, yes, well, hold on to this command by faith that it will do what it commands him to do. So what does he do? He gets up. So he, he can only reach and he can only tap into the ability to walk until he walks up, until he gets up. You see, God has availed for us solutions of deliverance, but they need some form of movement from us. Do you want to get out of debt? Stop spending on things you don't need. Do you want to be healthy? Stop eating every and anything that you come across. Then 
and, and by the way, this is just a simplistic solution that I'm giving you. Some of the things we need deliverance from don't need God to intervene in a divine and, 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 and expensive way. They just need us to be obedient to what he's already said. That's it. Get up and walk. There's a famous clothing brand that's out there. I like their payoff line. Just do it. Just do it. Do you want to be well? By faith, get up and do it. And the God who has been with you in your suffering, the God who has been specific and particular in, in addressing your needs, the God who has been present in the ashes of your suffering, the same God who didn't wait for you to get to him in order to worship him, but move to where you are so that you can fellowship and commune with him. The same God, the same God who knows what you need even before you ask him. The same God who delivers to you blessings that you have not even prayed for, that you didn't even know you had to pray for. The same God, the same God who saves you, not because of your faith, but in spite of your faith. The same God who's asking you today, do you want to be made well? Same God here today is issuing a command to you. Get up and walk. Dust yourself up and walk. Someone says the greatest miracle that we are experiencing right now is not that our circumstances are being reversed, but it is that we don't look like the things we are going through. There's no evidence of us in us of the things that we are going through. Don't allow your circumstances to manifest on you physic physically. Continue to defy them. Just do it. Get up and walk. Times it might be difficult. It might be an unfamiliar feeling to have a positive outlook. It might be an unfamiliar feeling to stop looking at yourself in relation to your circumstances and your suffering. It might be an unfamiliar feeling indeed to walk after 38 years of not walking. It might be an unfamiliar feeling to walk out of that abusive relationship, not just with a spouse, not just with a boyfriend, but also with friends. It might be an unfamiliar feeling to walk out of that abusive relationship with an employer. It might be an unfamiliar feeling, but your deliverance is just on the other side of bravery, on the other side of getting up and doing it. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word, now and forevermore. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you once again for your word. Thank you for allowing us to use it. Thank you for using it um, to bring life, to bring light, to bring order in the chaos of our lives. Thank you, dear Father, for your word this morning. Oh, dear Father, we ask in a special way for bravery. We ask in a special way for faith that will allow us, oh, dear Lord, to just get up and walk, to take up the mats of our suffering and to carry them, oh, dear Father. We ask at this time, oh, dear Lord, for strength to obey your commands, to obey your laws, oh dear Father. And to, we ask, oh dear Father, that obedience, the obedience that we uh, offer to you, that we give unto you, oh dear Father, may indeed lead us to our healing. I pray, oh dear Lord, that you may also deliver us from superstitious beliefs about you. You may deliver us from, our, from planting our faith in, in items, in rituals, in emblems, that, oh dear Father, our faith may not be in our pastor's our faith may not be even in our Bibles, but our faith may be in you, the power behind these things that we think are powerful. Give us direct access to you, for indeed we have it in Christ Jesus. Hear our prayers from wherever we are. Visit every room, every house. Visit every lounge room right now, every TV room right now that is listening to this message and hearing this prayer right now, dear Father. Be specific about their sufferings. Be specific in delivering them from their sufferings and from their struggles. Save, heal, deliver specifically and particularly. I pray, oh dear Lord, that you'll hear this prayer and that you'll answer it, not because it has been prayed by a pastor, but because we prayed believing in the mighty and wonderful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.